We'll start this course by considering fluvial or river environments because you're probably at least somewhat familiar with rivers and, and how they work to this, uh, some extent. Our ultimate goal is to use the characteristics that you can see in sedimentary rocks, like the Permian rocks from Italy in the, in the right-hand photo, to infer their original depositional environment. So that requires an understanding of the processes that operate in the modern environments, and especially the movement and the deposition of sediment, and how those processes lead to the formation of diagnostic sedimentary features. Uh, so this lecture covers the basics of river morphology and fluvial processes, and subsequent installments will focus on uh, sediment movement and sedimentary structures, and then we'll bring those two topics together to generate some models for relating the ancient deposits to their depositional environments. Rivers occupy a fundamental place in sedimentology because they're the most important pathway for sediment transport from its source area to the area of ultimate deposition. Most sediment you find in coastal areas was originally supplied by rivers. The sediment is originally produced by the weathering and the erosion of exposed rock by wind or water or ice. Um, sediment supply is dominated by areas of steep topography, like mountains, but erosion really occurs in all areas of exposed rock. The sediment is uh, transported through the river system before ultimately reaching the ocean and being deposited in coastal or other marine settings. So we'll come back later on to the question of whether the river merely transports sediment, called bypass, versus depositing sediment or eroding it. So first, some terminology to describe parts of the river system. Uh, rivers flow through something called a floodplain, which is the flat area of the valley floor that's filled with sediments deposited by the river itself. The width of the floodplain is marked on the photo on the right, and on the left, the area between the two slopes with trees is, is the floodplain. The actual area where the water is flowing is called the channel. Now, there can be more than one active channel, as in the, the left photo, or only a single channel, as on the right. In rivers where the channel is stable and, and fairly permanent, like the right-hand photo, uh, the remaining area of the floodplain is called the overbank area. So that's the flat area with the trees and the grass and, and so forth. The river on the left doesn't have a clear separation between channel and overbank uh, because the multiple channels are constantly shifting position. So these two photos illustrate the two main categories of rivers, braided rivers on the left and meandering rivers on the right, which we'll discuss further. Braided rivers get their names from the multiple intertwined channels that resemble braided hair or, or rope. Uh, the individual braids have low sinuosity, which means that they're relatively straight, uh, and they're separated by mid-channel bars. Uh, these raised bars are exposed when the water level is low, but submerged when the river has high water flow. Uh, the braid channels shift position frequently, so there isn't a clear differentiation between the channel and the overbank, and therefore the sediment in the channel is pretty similar to the sediment that makes up the bars. These bars typically move in a process called downstream accretion, where the upstream end of the bar is eroded, and that sediment is deposited at the downstream side, moving the bar further down the channel. Erosion and deposition processes occur only when the bar is submerged below the flowing water. Uh, the bar can grow laterally to the sides, or even accrete upstream in some cases, but those tend to be less common in these braided rivers. The bar types have been given many names, like longitudinal bars or lingoid bars, um, but those can be somewhat challenging to identify in the rock record, and they're not that much of a focus of this class. Um, that's true especially without good outcrops, so we're not really going to worry about them that much. The other main category of river is the meandering river, named because of its highly uh, sinuous channel that meanders back and forth in big sweeping bands like you can see in the photo on the left in particular. Meandering rivers have a single channel, predominantly have a single channel, uh, that's confined within stable banks. The channel does move, they do meander as their name suggests, and we'll talk about that more on the next slide, uh, but it's not nearly as unpredictable or as shifty as the channels in, in braided rivers. 
So because the channel is fairly stable, the overbank region is clearly separated. There's often a raised bank called a levee that, at the edge of the channel. And the overbank has quite different sedimentary features from the channel itself. This sharp differentiation between the channel and the overbank sediments is a major distinction between meandering and, and braided rivers. Uh, meandering rivers are also characterized by point bars, which are these, these sandy areas attached to the inside of the meander bends. And those can be compared or contrasted with the abundant mid-channel bars in braided systems. So because meandering channels are typically sinuous, there are, are quite noticeable differences in current velocity within the channel. The current flows faster on the outside of the bend because it has a greater uh, have to travel a greater distance, and that greater velocity is a higher shear stress or or and against the bank, which leads to erosion. The ability of the river to move sediment depends on the current velocity, and we'll cover that in the next lecture. So slower flow on the inside part of the bend tends to promote deposition of sediment and formation of this point bar. Because of that pattern of erosion and deposition, the meander bend tends to grow outwards, and that it gets elongated and more bendy, uh, and the point bar also grows by lateral accretion perpendicular to the flow direction. You can see uh, that on the right-hand picture in particular where the little um, curved ridges mark the former position of the point bar as the channel is migrated to the left, or the band is migrated to the left. So in contrast to this lateral accretion, remember that braided rivers, or the bars and braided rivers, tend to grow by downstream accretion. So this is again a pretty major distinction between the two types of rivers. Meandering river systems can also include another distinctive feature that arises because of the separation of the channel from the overbank. In this example here, the sort of swampy areas are the overbank. So there can be a raised levee, the line with the trees here. Um, so that means if the water breaks through the levee during a flood, for example, it can rush into the overbank area, spreading out and creating this fan-shaped deposit here called a crevasse splay deposit. The overbank area is normally characterized by sediment deposited from very low energy water, like in ponds or swamps or in, in standing water. Uh, so the abrupt influx of this water, this bursting through, um, is a major contrast in, in water energy. So again, next class we'll talk about how this type of sediment and the type of sedimentary structures that you find um, are fundamentally controlled by the speed of the water flow. Although braided and meandering rivers are, are certainly the two most important types of river morphology, uh, rivers can also be anastomosing or even have straight channels. Uh, anastomosing rivers have multiple channels, but unlike the braided rivers, those channels are fairly stable and have permanent or at least very long-lived uh, and often vegetated islands between the channels. Individual channels may be highly sinuous, but don't necessarily need to be. But anyhow, names like braided or meandering or anastomosed or whatever are, are certainly convenient terms, but in reality, river channel morphology is a continuum, and these discrete categories are just arbitrary uh, distinctions that we make. Nevertheless, the type of channel can be st still be very informative because it may be influenced by things like gradient or sediment supply or vegetation or other factors, and this is what you'll see in, in class. One final word of caution, rivers can be very large systems and the floodplains can be many kilometers across, but the outcrops that you're typically going to have access to are quite small, maybe a few hundred meters across. So the example uh, here is, is really an extreme case, but, it, but sort of note that it may require very careful observation and integration of multiple outcrops to make inferences about the entire river system from the small windows that you might have from any given outcrop.